All right, my name is Glendon Cameron, and let me get a little closer to the mic because I've been using my voice so much, I have to speak a certain way so I don't wreck it. That's something else that was starting to happen. All right, once again, this is Glendon Cameron. Welcome to 30 Days to $2,500. I am really excited. We are on the second leg, so to speak, because we hit the midway point yesterday. This is day 16. I'm very, very excited. I want to say everyone that's been here from day one, you're doing the tasks, you're doing the exercises, pat yourself on the back, say congratulations, because there's quite a few people who have crossed the $2,500 mark already, and this isn't even done. So give yourself a big hearty congratulations, and know that if you do these things, you will be successful. I can't put a numerical value on this. And I will tell you that the people who really knocked the ball out the park were business owners. These are folks who are working their business full time. So they had an advantage over those of you who have a job, but they took advantage of it. So let's just jump into it. If this is your first day here, you're going to need a sheet of paper, pen or pencil, calendar, because on the second leg or the second or the middle third, just depending on where you are, you, the exercises are going to become a little bit more involved and they're going to take a little bit more time to accomplish. But the cool thing is, if you do the exercises, you will be successful. It's not rocket science. It's not like you got to go out and break the, the Russian code or the German code during World War II. Nothing like that. What you have to do is stay on top of your data. Days 1 through 15 discussed a lot of things, a lot of procedures. So it's very, very important for you to stay on top of your data and your metrics. This was the end of uh, yesterday, day four, day 15. This is something, you, you know, so this is the weekend. This is something that you can start really, really, you know, hammering down. Because many, many people go out, get stuff buy it at a garage sale, get it from a thrift store, and hope to make money. Let's just invert that whole process and it's like, okay, let's go to the market first and let's research a bunch of items and then after you research your items, figure out what is your most profitable item and just sell a snot out of that stuff. So, Definitely, this is something that's going to be a little bit more involved. This is one of the tasks. This is why I put the slide back up so you can really look at it because I want you to really think about this. If you do this and you find out it takes you two hours to get your most profitable out item, and let's just say, let's throw a number out there that you make 100 bucks getting this item, and you make 100 bucks every day because you only find one per two hours, and then it's like, oh, this is the most profitable item and this is what I need to do for my procedure then you spend eight hours a day looking at it you're at four hundred dollars a day that's a hundred and seventy five thousand a year because it's a business and business works seven days a week and you will have online services so understand there's a lot of power in doing these exercises and <laughs> we're back. Now, this is going to be a long-term task. But that's why it's at the front. It's time to have the garage sale of a lifetime. Yesterday, someone's like, if you were going to have a garage sale, if you were going to sell stuff, would you do it the same way you did it last time? And I said, absolutely. And it got me to think, when I did that, have that garage sale, I felt very free because I got rid of a lot of stuff. Because when you have a house, stuff just stacks up. You have closets with things. And you always have those moments when you move of finding stuff that you bought and forgot about and you really never had any purpose or use for it. And it's just been in your house living rent free. Time to stop that. What you're going to do with your house, apartment, whatever, you're going to go around. And anything that's not essential to your lifestyle or does not have sentimental value and maybe keep a few, few things. Just a few. It's going to go. You're going to get rid of all that. You're going to clean out closets. You're going to clean out basements. You're going to clean out the garage. You're going to do all of this. Now, for some of you and for everyone that emails me at Glendon at the American Hustler, I'll send you a link to my garage sale ebook. 
So that'll help you out. Just let me say that again. Everyone that wants help with this, send me an email to glendon at theamericanhustler.com and I will send you a free link to my garage sale book. Just letting you know. That's what I'm going to do for you since we people like that. You might be FF and stuff. All right, let's get down to it. I need your word. I pledge to make myself better today than I was yesterday. Day by day, I will become the hustler I know I can be. I am all in. You must prep and motivate and just put your mind in the mode of success every day. I came up with this pledge because when I was in the military, I had to take this oath at the MEP station. And I just remember how I felt when I said it because I was scared. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I felt a little proud in some aspects of who I was. So this is a very, very powerful thing to do every day if you take it serious. It really is. This is day one. Sourcing is oxygen to your hustle. It's going to be a two-parter on this one. The next one will be Monday. There are no, There's nothing this weekend. There's no webinar scheduled this weekend. Next webinar will be Monday. But we're going to start from the top of the tree, so to speak. This is where you make your money. There's nothing to sell if your basket is empty. This is the thing, and this is mostly for people who sell, buy and resell stuff. You know, if you have a service, it's a different animal. But many people do not spend as much time on sourcing as they do. I'll give you an example. Uh, folks who are in this space who make YouTube videos, I look at the videos. I noticed something about everyone that was serious about their business. They stop making videos or they cut way back. They stop making them all together or they cut way back. And there's a reason. You lose focus of what you're doing when you're trying to serve two masters. I make videos to promote my business. I'm only serving one master. If you're trying to educate your fellow person, and there are many people on YouTube who put up videos that are very educational, like I would say the Paper Castle. A lot of people don't know about that. A lot of good stuff there. Doing it out of the goodness of our heart. There's a lot of people who do that on YouTube. But when you have people making videos over and over, you know, trying to instruct, having groups, having all this other stuff, they're trying to do what I'm trying to, what they're trying to do what I'm doing, but they're not being really honest about it. Because the reason I can be unvarnished with you, I can give you the truth, I am never ever going to be competing with you in any shape, fashion, or form on this stuff. The information I'm giving you is going to benefit you because it cannot hurt me ever. That's how I roll. A lot of people disagree with that, but... You know, this uh, with the marketing, because, you know, just to peel back some more layers. I have other sources of income. I'm a writer. I have books out under a pen name. I've got other stuff. And I have even larger plans for that stuff going forward in the future. And, you know, you can't really compete with a writer because if your book is good, people will read it. If it's not good, they're not going to read it. I mean, that's the competition. You're really competing with yourself to make yourself better and better and better. So, you know, my 10 year plan, my 20 year plan, they're like really different from what's going on right now. And I understand that as a writer, you need inventory and it takes time to put that inventory together. Because when I did my business model, I noticed that all the mid list writers, these were people who were maybe not household names, but people knew who they were in publishing circles. They all had 10, 15, uh, 20 yeah, 15 to 25 books. Because this is what happens. You have that first book, right? They like it. Then they buy the second. They buy the third. Then they buy the fourth. But wait a minute. What if your book's like three to four bucks profit? And you've got 20 books. So you get a person in. If they buy all your books, it's $60. But wait a minute. They bought all your books, so they'll tell a friend. That's really 120 maybe even 180 So that's a different game. You know, when I finish up this, I'm going to go back and hustle the university because I'm going to trick it out. And we're going to talk about the creation of digital products and these other things. And I'm going to give you my methodology there because I've learned some things about this. And that's in the vein of sourcing because I create my inventory. But just like you who are going out there to find or your inventory, we have the same principles we must follow. I can sit down here and write all kinds of stuff and market may go, 
Boo! Yes, boo, boo, boo. Oh, man, that's garbage. Because I didn't do my research. The books I'm writing now, I take my time, and I write in a market that wants that kind of book. So I got to do the same thing that you're doing. And I guess for people who are providing a service, you need to know if the market wants your service. You know, you got to understand that. So this is where it starts. Just for like me as my career as a writer, just for like, you know, you, it all starts with the sourcing. You know, I already see a bunch of people are going for that free ebook. Uh, it, it will probably be this weekend before I send them out, but I will send them out. So, okay, now let's get into it because I just saw those emails roll by because a bunch of them did. Y'all are not playing. I like that. Now, this, this is really, really critical. The sourcing, this is where the rubber meets the road. You can have the fastest car in the world. You can have a great engine, great paint job, but this, the rims, the tires, the transmission, if none of that stuff is in gear, is working, your pretty fast car is going nowhere. This is it. This is your sourcing. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it gets hot. This is where the action happens. And this is something else. The things you hate to do are the efforts that bring in the money. Remember what I told you about YouTube videos? I hated them. I really hated them. I mean, I was scared. I was just nervous. I was awkward. I mean, it was just horrible and I hated it, but it's what brought me the money. So there's something in your business that you may hate, not like. I am willing to bet you that if you become really good at that thing that you don't hate, don't like, that you hate, whatever, that your business will take off. Because when I started to like videos, which was right like the 10, 12 month mark, I mean, it took a long time to get comfortable. And even with that journey, I'm still doing stuff with it. I'm still a lot of room to grow with my videos. The money started to roll in because I got into that hot spot. Put videos up, sell books. Put more videos up, sell books. I need to become good at videos because the videos sell books. So something in your business is like that. I guarantee it. And maybe you know it and you're working on it. Or maybe you're running from it. I don't know. But if you go ahead and just... I'm going to do this, you know, I don't like it, but I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it well and I'm going to get better and better and better and better and better at it. Your business will rock out. Now, this is another part of sourcing because, like I said, this is day one of the sourcing deal. It's all about perceived value. This is something I learned in the storage auction business time and time again. It was amazing how often when you get to your research that you would have a product A and a product B. Product A being the expensive version, product B being the um, private label version. Because you ever go to the store and you're like looking at the macaroni and cheese, you know, the craft, and then you go look at the generic. You turn over the boxes, it's the same ingredients, and you look and it's made in the same place. <laughs> This happens even on the larger level. Lexus, Toyota, Nissan, Infiniti, Volkswagen, Porsche. I mean, <laughs> it, it happens. Bentley, Rolls Royce. But that's high end and high end. High end and higher in the air, so to speak. But the, the first bag is a uh, Louis Vuitton, and the second one's a bag of Target. Now, the Louis, 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 650. And the leather bag at Target is 110. Let's just parse this out. Let's just say that it took a hundred bucks to manufacture that bag for Louis, and I doubt it did. No, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't because it was mass produced. Even though it's mass produced for wealthy people, it's still mass produced. So there's certain metrics of scale that kick in. I don't know the. I'm just gonna throw a number out here, but I would not be shocked if it took twenty to thirty dollars to make that Louis Vuitton bag that they're selling for six fifty. And then maybe it took 10, 15 bucks to make that bag that sold at Target. Now, bags are nice. Nice red. They're nice bags. They're stylish. Why would someone spend $540 more for a bag 
that they could, you know, they'd get the same service from a bag for, for 500, I mean, far, far less. Why? It's about perceived value. This, and then we're going to get deep in this because I know it says sourcing. I'm going to tell you the stuff that I started to learn that increased my business. And it's not like white papers about sourcing or business classes about sourcing. I learned how people think. I started studying psychology. The best salespeople in the world are innate and natural psychologists. They know human nature. They figured it out on a subconscious level and they use those skills to make sales. Give you an example of this very thing. When we had the warehouse, it was 4,000 square feet and this was the 10,000 square foot warehouse. It was 4,000 square feet. There was everything in that section was a dollar, clothing, toasters, whatever, because we got that stuff over and over. I mean, if I bought out 10 units, I was going to fill up that section every time. And there was a lot of items in there that people could go in and buy and resell on eBay because we had a lot of eBayers coming there because they love that section. It's like, this is a treasure hunt. And I am a pirate. So they'll do their stuff, right? But what we learned was by putting a velvet rope. I'm not bullshitting you. We had a velvet rope to the section leading to the section of the higher price stuff. Go ahead. Let me go back. 4,000 square feet was dollar shit okay then another three yeah another three to four thousand square feet was mid-market stuff you know stuff hundred to five hundred bucks but mostly being we're really being like no 25 to 500 bucks and some furniture and then the last two thousand was the nice stuff pool tables uh the fully tricked out bedroom sets the big screen televisions the flat screens all the nice stuff went there and that area was very clean it was very tidy because when there was no visible line of delineation people didn't see the value because they were just like i'm going from junk to something something else. there was no division when we put up the the aisles and we put up the velvet ropes people paid more money it sounds crazy my partner and i was just like okay because what we did was we created perceived value when everything was all cluttered together because we had the warehouse organized in a certain manner because you need walls of divisions you cannot have somebody going from a five dollar item to a five thousand dollar item because let's let's just take antique shops like the shops with their high-end stuff if you know everybody's booth has high-end stuff um there was the great gatsby there was something else baron's auctions here everything in there was like thousands and thousands of dollars so you have to have that perceived value that's why if you go out and have a picasso and it's an authentic picasso you can prove it's a picasso and you try to sell that bad boy at your garage sale no one's gonna buy it because it's going to have to go into a high-end art gallery or high-end auction. Certain things have to be put in certain places. But with these bags, it's the perceived value that makes it sell. Because there's not a lot of difference in the actual cost of the manufacture of these items. It really isn't. Not a hell of a lot of difference. They may even be made in the same factory. Because another thing I learned, because I got the manifest of this guy who was an importer exporter, a lot of factories bid on jobs. Like, when I was selling furniture, sometimes I could get furniture super cheap because the company that was selling me the furniture changed manufacturers and they changed specs. So they just blew everything out because they knew the other stuff possibly was not going to match up. So there's there's a lot <laughs> to be said for that. This is one of the books because I was on this tip a long time ago, but this book really, really helped me. I'm going to say get the book. I've mentioned it before. You can get it like really cheap on Amazon. Uh, you can get the paperback for four bucks. Get it. Get the book. Read it from cover to cover. And you're going to learn some stuff about yourself. But once you pick up this stuff, you're going to learn how to sell your stuff better. You know, this is going to be very, very crass. But the average prostitute that makes two to four to five hundred dollars per session isn't really that attractive. You would think that all of these are like gorgeous. No, they're not. They're regular girls, but they enhance the perceived value of their company. Go to Vegas. And I think 
Because you'll find them in the hotels. You'll see them. They'll be there. All those girls, I think, are, I don't know. What are they? Because I always went to Vegas with a woman, so I never had to venture into that side of the world. Um, but it's four, five, six. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, whatever it is. And they've created that value because they asked the price and they work in an environment where everyone is kind of understanding the rules and they're working it because it works by having that perceived value. But get the book. Get the book. You will love the book. Now, I'm going to talk about myself and my own level of irrationalness. BMW has my mind. I've had like five of them. And I'll probably have some more in the future. And like, why do I like BMW? What is it? You know, the ultimate driving machine. Their marketing worked on me. I can know I could go out and get a car way cheaper to get me from point A to point B. Easy. I know this. Don't want to do it. <laughs> I wanted the X5. It took me two years to get that X5. I wanted it that long. And then when I started looking for it, it took me like six months to actually buy it because I was looking in state, out of state. Because this, this is just a little quick story about Atlanta. Atlanta's full of posers because most of the cars here are leases. And there's a glut. And that's how I got my I got my X5 super cheap. I got my if I wrecked it, my insurance company's giving me a check for six or seven grand because I got it so much under the book bag. And the reason is there's a glut of X5s in Atlanta. But I noticed when I was looking around the country, like when I go to Florida, it was like for sale by owner. These people actually paid the car off. Same thing with California, D.C. area. It was very, very interesting where there was like a whole bunch. In the places where they were like for sale by owner, there wasn't this glut. There were certain cities there was a glut. And when I got, did all my research, I came back home, went out, went to Nally BMW. They didn't want to haggle, so I left. Then I went up to Gwinnett to the other place and I walked in. This is what I want. Here's my, I'm pre-approved. No, I'm not filling out your paperwork. And 45 minutes later, I rolled out. And that was after taking the test drive. So with that, it's just for me, in my world, the BMW has a perceived value that may not have for anyone else. There are people who laugh at folks like me. It's like, yeah, they're buying luxury cars. What's wrong with those people? Now, I will go back to Thor, who's Thor's deceased. Let's say a moment of prayer. Let's have a, well, if I had some liquor, I poured out for those who are not with us. Uh, Thor got to the point, well, Thor was a 1994 525i. And Thor got to the point where so many things were going wrong that my mechanic was like, really to get it. I mean, it was just so many things went bad, like in two month period. A radiator, air conditioning, it's going to need a brake job. It was leaking, and I think from the sunroof. And, you know, it was like four grand. And I was just like, the value on that car was like 2,500 bucks. So I got rid of it. And it was an emotional decision because I had the car for so long. And because, you know, what I said earlier about the paint job, I got compliments on that all of the time. All of the time because it looks so good. But, for you know, you we all are prey to this. Believe it or not, we're all prey to this, and it's different things for different people. But that's just to illustrate to you how strong perceived value is. Because I didn't buy it new. I don't buy cars new. And I think my car, when it was new, was 80000 90000 for that model. Something like that. I ain't paying anything close to that. Even They ain't pay half of that. But you could go to... Say a Honda Pilot, you know, it's not as fast, it's not going to corner, it's not going to do all that stuff, but it's going to be just as good for probably a third of the price. That's the reality. Like I said, you know, this is 30 days to $2,500, but we deal in reality. I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, no, no, it's much better. I'm not, I already know what I'm doing. See, that's the beauty of when you get to an ownership of your life and an intent and design, you know what you're doing and you know why you're doing it. And if it doesn't make sense to anyone else, you don't care because it's your life. That's the deal. I know I could have got something way, you know, I could have got something new for what I paid for that. But for me, the perceived value was that high. So this is the deal. When you stop hating and start relating, you could do the same thing. Create the value, recognize it's much easier to criticize than to create and this is what I do with my stuff because we live in an economy where people want to become discounters. That's because it's easier to do than trying to create value. 
Since I started this, July 17th, 2009, that's when I started this, when I was pent that first few lines of that book, I've increased my value and I've increased my prices. This is part of a plan. I don't just like, well, today is Tuesday, so I'm going to raise the price. No, everything I do, I try to push myself to create enough value to justify raising the price. Most of the time, it doesn't work out. Once again, I am not afraid to fail. It, mo it does not work out. I'll do it. And y'all be like, <laughs> Glenda, nah. And then I'll do something and it'll hit and people buy. Because that's part of the experimentation and the exploration. But see, this is something else. Going back to the things that happened in the first six days. I know my metrics. I know my numbers. Because I understand in this space, a lot of people are not going to pay for this information. It's kind of like, and this is going to be really crass, but if you are like not really an attractive girl, I'm going to say that, you shouldn't put out. You shouldn't screw everyone. You should make every dude you date wait because it increases the perceived value. I have a story of a friend who did that. Now, she's actually pretty, pretty nice, but... We were talking and she's, you know, she was no virgin. And once again, she was dealing for position where she said, I want to get married and I cannot continue to do the things I'm doing and expect different results. Brilliant statement because it's true. And she just like, I'm not, I'm celibate till I get married. Took her three and a half years to get married and she did not break her vow to herself. And it was just, um, she did that. Cause she now this is the thing. Now she's a very religious person. She is. You if you, you guess that. But what she did is she created a goal. I was with her the day she did it. I want to get married. Walked through the whole thing. I'm not sleeping. And she, you know, then she worked on herself. She worked on herself. She had a diary. She had a blog. She talked about all this kind of dark stuff. And she created this process because she had a goal. She had a methodology. This is the thing. This is what I looked at it. And I was sitting there like, this is amazing. Because some people innately do this and they contribute it to the universe of God and some other stuff. She actually made some really good decisions for herself. And she increased not only to her perceived value to other people, but she increased her value to herself. And when you innately radiate that value, people pick up on it, you know, because in the first year was the Rockets. Because, I mean, she like, oh, my God, I'm about to climb the walls here. It would be so nice to call Tyrone. And she did. And I was like, OK, OK, you got it. You, you. I was her celibate, celibate partner, one of them, because she had other people she talked to about it because she, she put it out there to everybody. She you know, but what, what does that do? It made her more accountable. And I was like, okay, you got this goal. You're not going to do it. And he's like, all right, thanks. And I was like, go get a glass of wine or something. Just keep your ass at home, lock the doors, <laughs> you know, and call Bob. Don't call Tyrone. Call Bob. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of her because she created a goal and she went for it. And anyone can do this because this is the thing, you know, just to go completely 80% off to the left here. You want to get married, you, wanna, you can do it. You create that goal, you create that energy, and you prepare yourself. You can do it. It's not like there, there's tons of great people out there. There's awesome people out there. There's a lot of really good men. There's a lot of really good women. They're out there. And how do you get them? By becoming one of them. Yeah. My very white voice. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. <laughs> High dollar sourcing. Stop being afraid of uh, expensive stuff. Uh, this is one of the things. Because... It can be slower to sell. It can be. It can be trickier to deal with. It can be. I've dealt with stuff like this. And the beauty of you have three different pricing models. You've got really cheap stuff. you got mid-market stuff. Because I do everything like I did in the storage shops business. We have really cheap stuff, mid-market stuff, high-end stuff. And the deal is, if you've got your low-margin stuff or cheap stuff, really clicking where you have consistent cash flow, the bills get paid. The bills get paid, money goes in the bank, you may even have savings. Then you sell your mid-market stuff, bam, profit. Then you sell your high-end stuff, bam, profit. So just think about this. If you had a $500 product and you sell 20 a month, that's 20000 in sales. Say your expenses are high, really, really high, and you only net out at 6000 which means you've got 14 Gs in expenses. I think that's worth it because 
Let's look at it. 20 a month. You've got to sell one and a half every other day. Or you got to have a week where you sell five or six in a week. Or, you know, maybe blow out and create some kind of special where you sell 10 in a day. Or if you really are balling, you create a promotion and you sell 20 in one day. Think about that. You do something like that. You maybe do it four times a month. It's an eighty thousand dollar a month. That's eighty, and that's eighty products. So do not be afraid of high dollar stuff. Just figure out how you can get your hands on it and where it needs to go. Booyah! Yeah, I changed it. No think fast. No, 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 no. This is this. You've got to stretch. You got to up your game. You got to up your game. This is your task for this webinar. Find one five hundred to a thousand dollar product you can sell. Mix this in with your normal stuff and start. And if if the product that you find, once again, this is day 16, you know how to create business. You know how to validate business. You can just create another business real quick to handle that one product. So you got two businesses. You got a low end business, a high end business. You can do that. There's so many different ways that you can do this. You could just really rock out. But this is your task for this webinar. Well, one of them. Find one five hundred to $1,000 product you can sell. That's your task. You got to find something. And then, you know, that's not profit. That's the growth. That's the total sales price. I mean, you know, typically if you're keystone in something like it's 500 bucks, you pay two something, maybe three and blew it out at a lower margin. But say you spend 900 bucks on the product, product ah, spend 900 bucks on the product and you realize $600 profit. But if you can turn fast, so you can turn those products in the day, it's worth spending that money. So that's your task for upping your game. Oh, I've got more. Yep, 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 yep. Now this is going to be completely way off because we went to the left. Now let's bring it back and we're going to go to the right. This is another thing that you're going to do. You're going to plan an ultra romantic date for yourself. If you have that type of relationship, you're in a relationship or you're dating someone, do this. If you don't, no, you don't get to skate. What you're going to do is call up your friends, and I think this might even be more interesting, and say, hey, I'm taking this course, 30 days, $2,500, and this is one of the tasks. And I know it's crazy, but what I want to do is set up a date for you and your boo. And, you know, romantic, whatever your ideal of romantic, you may want to have a conversation with the people. Now, you're going to just like, now I'm going to give you what I've, I've done this, okay? I've done this. I know this is going to sound strange, but I'm hopeless romantic. This is what I did to get someone once, and it kind of shocked me with it, how she felt. And this is the thing that's going to crack you up. It was 100% free. Yeah, just because it's ultra romantic doesn't mean it has to be ultra expensive. It doesn't. Living in Atlanta, there's a lot of free stuff, or really cheap stuff. But what we did, and this this is just, just, just crazy how it happened. Uh, I was in downtown. I ran to a friend who gave me a coupon for a dinner at this nice restaurant. Just gave it to me. I was like, hey, you can have this. And I kept it. So what we did was we went to dinner at the restaurant on the coupon. Then we went to what's called Screen on the Green. There's the High Museum here and the Woodruff Art Center. And there's the space between both of them. In the summer, they all have like Screen on the Green. And they'll show these movies. And it's like... Really, really romantic because as it gets twilight, you're laying on the grass, people got the shoes off. So I'm with her. We just had the dinner and everything. Had a little, you know, a little wine and dinner and everything. And we're just laying there watching the movie, talking because, you know, everyone's around. There's kids. There's people got the dogs and stuff. It's a really, really cool thing. And, you know, we're sitting there on this blanket and everything. She brings the blanket and we're watching the movie. It comes up. Next thing you know, we're like making out in front. Of, and there was other people doing the same thing. Then watching the movie, make out a little bit and everything. Then we had drove in separate cars and then parked in a the garage thing that was like close to the Woodruff Center. And I'm walking her back to the car, holding hands and everything, got the blanket. Then, you know, walked to her car, give her a little kiss, squeeze her on the butt, you know, that's how I do. And I went back to my car and everything. And it was just a really, really fun evening, great evening. And I heard from her the next day, and I mean early, because you know, I was getting ready to do my thing at the storage auction business. And she's like, I just want to thank you. I was like, what? She's like, I've never, that's the best day of my life. 
I mean, the girl was crying. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. no, she said, no, that's, that's like the best date of my life. I've never been on a date like that. So just to let you know, by just setting, you know, part of setting up an ultra romantic date is finding out what that person thinks is romantic. Cause you know, everyone's like romance is flowers. No, you know, for certain people, buying them a great book could be romantic. Uh, cooking their favorite dish, not any dish, but their favorite dish could be romantic. Uh, going for a walk. There's so many things that you can do. So what does this have to do with sourcing? It opens up your level of creativity. The more creative you are, the easier it will be to find product. And also tell them, there's this crazy guy who's got a channel on YouTube. He's nuts and he's making me do this. This could be very, very fun. Now, here's a tip for those of you who may have problems when you're trying to call a company because some of you may go wholesale. This is something I got out of a book because I was sucking at cold calls. And this is one of the tips in the book. When you're calling someone you don't know, a lot of times they won't answer the phone and you leave a voicemail. They won't even listen. But this is what I did to get a lot of people to call me back. Oh. Sorry, who you're looking for ain't here and ain't trying to answer your damn call. Beep. Hey, this is Glendon Cameron. I'm calling you in reference to Monty Price. Thank you very much. Give me a call back at XXXXXX. Click. That little ditty got people to return my calls 95% of the time. Now let's talk about why. We go back to the book, Predictably Irrational. It's a little bit easier than that, but... Essentially, I wasn't calling for them. I was calling for someone else. And it gets their curiosity because they would call back and it's like, hey, Glenda, uh, you know, this is Joe. Who, Money Price, I think you got the wrong number. <sighs> oh my, Joe, wow, you're, man, you are a prince. I'm sorry. Actually, I should have called you next. Somehow, I was just going down my list, but hey, my Glenda name is Glenda Cameron. And I'm with Renecrate, and it's my understanding that you are about to do a corporate move. At that point, you know, I got to go into my pitch. But the thing is, you can't pitch anyone unless they call. And then a lot of, you know, a few people knew that they were shammed, but they went with it, right? <laughs> they knew it. And then I had one guy, and he was like, well, you call for money price. Now you're, and I just, you know, at that point, I was like, I don't have nothing to lose. I was like, or are you moving or are you not moving? It's like, yeah, we're moving. Okay, great. I have a solution for you. When can you meet? Get the appointment and get off the phone. So when you're dealing with some of this stuff, maybe they're hiring products and you're trying to get people to call you back, this could be a little sneaky way to get them to call you back. Okay, so we're going to see what's here in the realm of questions. You used to be a car salesman, so you know the ins and outs. Um, that had, I didn't learn that trick from car sales. Car sales, they came to us. This this was something totally different. Uh, this is Richard. How can I source more chairs? Now, this is something you can do if you're willing to really travel. Um, you can use the Craigslist from a few different states. You can buy stuff from eBay. Or, I don't know if they, I actually found the day, I don't know, like in my group, I had actually put up the, the pilot for the storage auction show that I actually found that shit today and I put it up in my Hustle University. I actually found my source for Herman Miller and I used to be able to get them for 350 I don't know. I'll call them up and see if they're still making deals, because if they are, you know, I'll let you know. I cannot remember the name of that book that I got the cold calling tip from. I cannot remember it for the life of me. I just know it was red and a red and black cover with a phone on it. I cannot, I just cannot remember it. But it was like 12 bucks. I do remember that. And it was a well spent 12 bucks. Because, you know, I'm always talking about, you know, paying for your education, buying your education. That 12 bucks really probably matriculated into... $200,000 worth of sales for rent crate if not more, before I left, because I got the book maybe three months before I left. So, yeah, it was definitely worth it. And they actually paid for it, too. 
they actually paid for it because I told them what I was doing and they, 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 they reimbursed me. So I didn't even spend it. Uh, Betty, this is from a few days ago. When is the time to ink LLC? Do you advocate doing it yourself with the associated research? Do you think it's a good idea to use legal zone? You, legal Zoom. If you are not going to have like trucks and stuff in your LLC, do it yourself. If you're going to have a building, all kinds of other stuff, you may want to talk to somebody. Here in Georgia, I think it's like 100 bucks. You could do it, an LLC online, and you have an LLC in like 10 minutes. But yeah, do the research. If you spend a day researching LLCs, corporations, you'd be very educated on it. Tell me, what is the best place to, well, how to ship more cheaply, especially larger items, no luck with the post office? FedEx. FedEx is, well, it, yeah, FedEx is cheaper than UPS. DHL used to be cheaper, but they're kind of hard to get to. Uh, what about the sites like Liquidators, Alibaba? Alibaba is great for finding people to make stuff for you. Uh, DHgate. This is my thoughts on those sites. I think if you search and you going back to being creative, you have a way to maybe create a bundle or something from two products, create something different. I think you can find a lot of benefit. But if you're just going to buy a straight product from those sites and sell against other people based on price, it's not a good idea. Nah, that's that's cool. That's cool because uh, I didn't use a calculator on that one, and I should have went to a thousand. Because actually, I screwed up on the math, and actually, some of these screw ups you see in these slides are actually intentional. But that one wasn't one. That wasn't one of them. Don't know if I should mention it, but five hundred times twenty is ten k, not twenty k. But awesome info. Nah, no, nah, you got me. I screwed up. Uh, what are the best sell books? Do you recommend anything by Daniel Pink? Uh, Byron, you mentioned a while back that you saw great potential from the business side of the DJ. And what do you mean by that? Uh, most DJs are creative people, and mo a lot of creative people aren't real good with the business side. If some guy became a promoter and got a stable of 10, 15, 20 DJs and then created, then this person went out and found the jobs and split the, the profits 50 50, they can make a lot of money pimping out DJs. I'm quite sure someone's doing that as we speak. David, what do you think about making a digital product that sells for five hundred to a thousand instead of sourcing and selling one? I look at Forrester reports as an example of a product like that. I think of making a digital product that sells for five hundred to a thousand bucks is great because <laughs> I do that. Um, the thing with these other products, because you know, if you go to the Warrior Forum, there's a lot of information about that. I looked at that stuff, and this is what I don't like about that market. They get you on the list. And they continue to sell and upsell and create this stuff. But a lot of it's just trying to teach you how to do what they did to you. Whereas this course is, if you sell bagels, it'll help you. If you sell cars, it'll help you. If you sell puppies, it'll help you. So this is more like teaching you how to run your business idea versus adopting someone else's. Um, maybe that's a little unfair, but that's how I looked at it. And that's why I invested. And I know there's some people in that space making millions. I know it. But it's about the list, and it's about opportunity seekers. All right, I'll put this out. Anyone that wants the free garage sale book, email me at glendon at theamericanhustler.com. <laughs> Send it my way. Okay. Now, it's the garage sale book. That's the, I'm uh, everyone that does the task. I'll give you a copy of the garage sale book. Send me. I want the garage sale book at Glendon at the storage auction. Oh, man, sorry, Glendon at the American Hustler dot com. Josh, we're buying storage units and picking and want to start setting up a beat at a big flea market in Sacramento, California. Any good tips or advice? Be there early. Have some business cards, chat people up, and develop some regular clientele. This is where a lot of flea market vendors screw up. 
When someone comes to your place and they buy from you, you should capture their phone number and email address. So you get a big enough list, you don't have to go back to the flea market. You And also, you can sell seven days a week versus just a designated one or two. Uh, this is great. There, like I said, I'm quite sure. I mean, the idea was pretty simple, so I knew there was someone doing it. There are plenty of mobile D. This is from Greg. There are plenty of mobile DJ services out there that have several DJs working for them. Look on YouTube to see prime examples of profitable mobile DJ services. See, there it is. Michael, to the guy that wants to charge 500 to 1000 for a product, it's good if you can justify the value. Get the book Contagious by Jonah Berger. There you go. Great tip. Betty, have you utilized Sellhu? I've been on their list for years, was a bit antsy about sourcing. Uh, no, never heard of them until you mentioned them. Michael, this book goes into how to do that. There you go. Excellent example. Uh, David, has something like the money price call also worked for you with emails and converted to sales? Actually, I've never done that with an email. This is how I get someone by email that I want to reach. I go online and I find out something about them. You know, sometimes their Facebook page is wide open or they got something on LinkedIn. And then I think about, huh. Well, hey, I just came across this article about, you know, uh, screaming chinchillas, right? And the, and the person's like, oh, God, I love screaming chinchillas. Find some kind of interest they have and hit them with that. It usually works. This works for me. Chris, any insight how to handle friends who see you changing and are re and reacting negatively, negatively to the change? Um, brace for it, man. Uh, I had someone in my family call me a failure. Yeah. So, and this was like not too long ago. And I was just like, okay. Because the thing is, when you do make money online and you don't have a regular job, it is hard for people to understand. That's kind of one of the reasons that it's hard for people to make the transition from having a job to being a business owner because it's so hard to wrap your mind around the concept. But you're just going to be successful, man. You're going to get hate. You're going to get people questioning your uh, decisions. You're going to get people talking about you. Just keep trucking, man, because part of um, this course deals with that. Like, you know, days one through 15, there's stuff in there about that because it's going to come. And you just have to be your own internal cheerleader, so to speak. Have your own source of motivation and keep working hard on your business and know that you're going to be successful because when you jump out of the rim of the normal and become atypical, you also become a target. <laughs> Jelini, success is a jealous bitch. Fuck the haters. <laughs> That's funny, man. That's funny. Yeah, you're just going to have to develop a really thick skin. Um, you're only going to have a few friends who are going to really support you and be happy for you, truly, truly happy. And just know that I've learned not to tell people too much. And that came when I was a dickhead, bought the first BMW, went to my friend Chris's house. And Chris, we had the type of relationship, had, let me just say that again, had, where I could just show up, right? And when you call, just, hey, what's up, what's for dinner, you know? And I showed up with that car and I didn't know he had gotten laid off that day. He stopped talking to me. I called him up. We had a common core of friends. And I was like, hey, what's going on with Chris? He just stopped talking to me. I never saw it coming. I was completely, I was like, what the? Never saw it coming. Never. Yeah, had, had a friend because he's gone. I haven't talked to him since. Is Glendon at theamericanhustler.com. T H E. Any more questions? Because if not, it is 449, and I'm going to shut this puppy down. Uh, Manny, what kind of products would you suggest? Going back to 
all right, since you're in the group, start going through days one and there's tasks to help you with that because what everyone tries to do is figure out like, this guy's got a great product. Let me try that and sell it. No, no. Figure out what Manny brings to the table, what Manny can do, what you and your gorgeous girlfriend can bring to the table and you make your own thing. Don't do what someone else is doing. You know, maybe follow some of their methodologies to push your product, but create your own thing. Yes, it's more challenging. It's harder, but you make way more money, way more money. Because I'll just go ahead and tell you the secret of my success with this. Because my price points are so high, I don't have to sell a lot every month. And then I have a core group of subscribers that came in because this is I'll just go ahead and give you the whole business plan. I'll create a product in my mind. 30 days to 2,500 bucks. It will be free or real cheap, 10 bucks, whatever, $2. Then I will enhance it and improve it. And then later on, after you guys have helped me build it and say, oh, that kind of sucks. Oh, that's a problem there. Then I'll make it better and sell it because I've got a course. Because this course right here now is going to be, it's 300 bucks, you know, to get the lifetime. I'll just turn that into one year's access and then bump it up to $600 lifetime. And someone will pay it because it works. Because the thing is, what you guys are doing, and you understand, and you're helping me out tremendously, and I'm very grateful. You guys are providing something called social proof. When I got the email from the dude from 22, because he didn't want me to mention his name, uh, RC was like 16, and then other people, there's a lot of people that have crossed the $2,500. I'm just like, blown away that this working so well because this was beta so essentially by creating your own thing and going with the lumps and you know like i screwed up the uh, math on that thing because i didn't use a calculator and i was moving too fast and just dealing with that stuff you put yourself in a position to make a lot of money because there's no other course like this out there this crazy there's none and i love it Okay, well, that looks like this. Oh, that's one thing. Uh, Josh, what type of things from storage sharks did you choose to sell on eBay versus selling in your store? Our price point after we learned our lesson, we got to a point before we outsourced, we didn't care. But when we were doing it in-house eBay, our minimum price to put something up was 25 bucks. So that, you know, it was 25 bucks and it was something that would fit eBay. It didn't go on eBay and we stole it in the dollar section, the mid-market section eBay stuff had to be clean, issue-free, and easy to ship. All right, that's it, 452. Happy, happy Friday. Hope you guys have a great weekend. And guess what? I'm not even in the United States. <laughs> this is what I love about this, because I'm starting to take advantage of the opportunity and my freedom. I am not even in the United States, and I'm doing this, and I'm about to go walk on the beach. So with that... Thank you for uh, being here, and uh, I will see you on the good side, and the next webinar will be Monday. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.